Here. Director Hickok? Here. Director Weedman? Here. Director Wills? Here. Director Carpenter? Here. Acknowledge that we have a quorum. We also have with us this evening uh, Jerry Moss, principal for TCG Middle School, Ann Wenhoff, director of communication, Michelle Werman, board secretary, Jill Van Workum, associate superintendent, uh, Scott Bryan, uh, superintendent. Uh, first order of business is to receive visitors and read miscellaneous communication. Mr. Bryan, do we have any individuals that registered their intent to speak during the public comment portion of the agenda? We do not have anybody that wish to speak. Okay. Um, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move to approve. Pajarno. Second, Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Is there someone willing to serve as a temporary chair for the election of officers? Sure. <coughs> you're, yes. you're willing to, Sarah? Thank you. So we'll move on into the elect president and vice president portion of this. So that's where you'll have to pick up and look for nominations. Is there an agenda item that I can read the language from? It would, it would just just call for nomination. Okay. Doors open for nomination. We're going to start with uh, vice president. You need to start with the president. We're going to start with president, please. I would nominate Doug Grant. Is there a second? Yes, second. Wilson. Okay. Open the floor to votes. All in favor? Oh. Discussion. I think you said that. Is there any other? Any other nominations? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All in favor? Say aye. 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 All opposed? Congratulations. Okay, we will move on. Vice President. Do we need to take the... You can take nominations for the vice president. Vice, or I, did you want to do the uh, voice vote? Or do we just want to do that all at the same time? We can do both. Okay, okay. seeking nominations um, for vice president. I nominate Kathy Hickok. Second. Any other nominations? Okay, all in favor of voting Kathy Hickok. Aye. All opposed? Congratulations, Kathy. Thank you. Michelle, do we need to administer the oath of office? Yes. If you would both stand. solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, and that you will faithfully and impartially, to the best of your ability, discharge the duties of the office of Board President and Board Vice President of the Dallas Center Grimes Community School District as now or hereafter required by law. I will. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Okay, Second. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Uh, presentation of bills. Move to approve. Wills. Second. Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Which brings us to the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Move to approve Pajarno. Second, Weedman. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Which 
brings us to reports. Are there any questions on the written reports? If not, Jerry Halas, would you uh, provide the building level report? Uh, yes, I will. So first I'd just like to say thank you for um, the opportunity to present to the school board tonight. And it's been a long time coming, thinking about the 5-6 structure. Uh, I've been thinking about it quite a bit. And to think that we're under a year um, to when that opens um, is exciting, uh, but that also means time is of essence. And I just wanted to share tonight um, three main topics uh, related to the 5-6. One would be give you an overview of the, the master schedule that would include band, the core, the encore or exploratories. Also just give you an overview of how it will team, how it'll team um, students with teachers. And then also just touch on a little bit of that CTE strand of the 512 vision of agri-science and how that might impact our fifth graders. So I'll start with the master schedule and talking a little bit about how our fifth graders are going to have uh, the opportunity for band, uh, for rehearsal band. Um, we used to have that in fifth grade in the district and it was dropped for a few years and, and now we're gonna be bringing it back in a five, six structure. So I think that's exciting for our, our fifth graders. Our sixth graders will continue to have band um, in the same fashion. So. There will be a period of the day for our fifth graders where they will, they have the option to choose to be in a band. Um, opposite of the band will be um, some instructional methods time where sometimes we have time built in where we can work with kids in small groups. Um, it can be a study time for kids. Um, but I'm pretty excited about structuring that period, not only for our band kids, but for the kids that are not in band and what opportunities they could have in that period as well. For the, um, for the encore or the exploratory, in the fifth grade, there's five exploratories that they're familiar with. They're, they're guidance, library, PE, music, and art. Um, at the middle school, we currently had tech ed and computers application. Um, we're going to offer all seven of those um, we'll structure it in a way so that kids both in fifth and sixth grade will experience all of those. Um, they may not experience them all the same. Um, in the area of art, um, there's been, I, I've been talking with Mr. Grimes some too about how we might be able to block a little bit of extra time for art. Same thing with the tech ed type class. Um, but giving kids that opportunity. For our fifth graders, um, stepping into the technology education classroom will be a new experience. Um, and having a computer's application slash STEM um, would be new for them and, and new for our sixth graders too. Um, as I talk about the core, currently our, our fifth grade has upwards to around 270 minutes devoted to core instruction. And in our current sixth grade, we have about 220 um, as we divide up our day. In a five, six structure, I'm looking at around 240 minutes that we would uh, devote to core instruction. So there's a little bit of a happy medium there um, between the current fifth and the current sixth. Um, as you think about core instruction in a two person team, uh, the focus would be math on one team and literacy on the other team. And along with the math, there would be a science course. Along with the literacy course, there would be a social studies course. If you divide 240 in half, that's 120 minutes in literacy and social studies, another 120 in math and science. Um, I could see that core time having some flexibility for those two teachers to team and discuss what is the priority for that week, for that unit, a little bit of flexibility perhaps in how much time is spent on any given subject. But 
But again, as we move into more of a middle school structure, there does need to be some consistency as far as the schedule, when you have those exploratories, when you have a band period, and then you have your core content periods, there will be some structure there too, so that our kids understand that, hey, it's time to now go to math. I'm going to leave this classroom and go into another teacher's classroom for math. Um, and I think that's also, as the kids get to that upper elementary, early middle school, the idea of traveling from one class to another would be a good introduction for those kids. Um, when I think about the CTE strand or the 512 vision that Mr. Grimes has been talking with the district about, there is a strand of agri-science that I think could touch the fifth grade um, and sixth grade in terms of our technology education course. How could we bring that strand into that course where kids could, um, throughout the year, on a six day cycle be exposed to that strand. Um, there's talk too about how we could display uh, some local businesses of their equipment or some of their material for the kids to actually see. Um, and that could be a part of that strand as well. And so I think with the 512 vision, we're trying to see how can we bring that strand of science from the high school and then bring it down to that beginning stages of fifth grade to, to say that in our building kids have kind of their first look, first feel, um, first sounds of what all of that looks like. Now there's a lot of details that go into everything I just said um, but that's just a quick overview of what's what's to come and, and what's been planned and there's more to do and 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 i foresee meetings with fifth grade teachers and sixth grade teachers as we head into second semester um, we're going to be bringing in you know all the fifth grade staff all the kids that will be fifth and sixth graders will be their first time stepping into the building um, it's an exciting time i think at our middle school and an exciting time to transition into a five-six structure, and so those are my main main points to share tonight. I guess I would just ask if there are any questions. Maybe what are what do you expect the biggest challenge to be? I would say initially it will be bringing both fifth and sixth grade staff together um, and getting them to to understand the structure um, once we kind of lay out that target and say okay this is the amount of floor you have this is what the teaming will look like um, it's just new I, I think anytime we bring teachers into a new setting um, same thing for me as administrator I I've been thinking about this uh, for quite a while but I think we're at a point now where I start sharing this more, staff starts listening, they start looking at what it would be like. But again, with our, the current situation we're in, we're, we're distancing from each other, and I, I think that's an added challenge too, where really what we need to do is, is to be able to get some teachers together uh, to do this work. So we'll have to find ways to Zoom and, and discuss it that way as well. Uh, like I said, they're the only people in the building that uh, won't be new will be our sixth grade staff and, and the exploratory teachers that are there, but all the kids and fifth grade staff will all be new. Jerry, thanks for sharing all of this uh, presentation. I appreciate it. I'm so more. Um, I'm especially happy to hear that teachers are going to start to get involved in the planning because I know that they are probably quite anxious to be involved in the collaboration and knowing that this is a new model for the district. So I appreciate knowing that. Um, can you talk a little bit, perhaps, about what staff changes you anticipate, or perhaps if we're going to have new hiring, um, in particular, perhaps in those encore models, as we look at needs to make sure all those um, subjects are covered? Yeah. Well, currently in our in our six seven building, um, all of these um, exploratory courses that I mentioned are currently filled. 
Uh, we have staff that can teach all of those. Um, and at this point, I anticipate that we will, will have them in a 5 6 setting. Um, even though a tech ed and a, a computers class might be new to the fifth grade, it's not new to the sixth. And so the, the current staff would be able to take on that on that role. You're welcome. Jerry, maybe just a question around schedule. I know um, eight twelve this year moved to a block. Um, obviously fifth grade it sounds like there's gonna be some class movement in the future. And uh, assuming we stay with that kind of block idea at least nine twelve and maybe a little further down, I don't know if we can really answer that yet. What is that, if you think about just kind of trying to step kids into ultimately that, that block model, how does that look in fifth and sixth? Is it the same or is there some differences between five and six? I would, I would say there'll be similarities in five and six. Um, when you think about blocking, like in the, in the way I described the literacy with the social studies, um, the, the one difference in a 5-6 model that I would see from maybe the, the grades up above is that when we take that 120 minutes of time, um, there's some flexibility where those kids, you do have them blocked. So if there is a, a social studies project that is integrating the use of writing, and there's some research and some reading that's involved in that process, those kids will be able to go through that process with a teacher, one teacher guiding them through it all, and also being able to use that time allotment maybe more in a more flexible way than they would necessarily if there were more teachers involved and, and there were more periods and then that cross planning can be done, it's just a little more difficult. Um, so I would say in fifth grade, that there'll be that, that first introduction. And, and I think fifth grade teachers have done some of that in the past, where they partner up with, with a math teacher or, um, and then are able to have blocks of time with the same kids to do cross curricular type things or extended time on certain topics. Um, and I do think that that's one of the advantages of a, of a block. Jimmy, this is Sarah again, another question for you. Yes. Um, so, you know, one of the things I anticipate is some questions from the community about what does a 5-6 building do? Um, and how is it different than, you know, a traditional elementary school versus our middle school? So if you could maybe give us some talking sure. points or some things that you're thinking about, that your staff is thinking about, that your teachers are thinking about, how we can expect, what our expectations should look like and how that might feel, um, perhaps, what does it feel yeah. like, yeah. Um, you know, in a 5-6 building? Yes, um, I think one would be the, the introduction of instrumental music, the band piece, that's gonna be something that is brand new to fifth graders that um, elementary would not have. Um, in addition to that, the, uh, the technology education, the computer application STEM, that's an exploratory too that would be unique to a five, six setting that elementary would not have. Um, in terms of teachers and having two teachers and having some movement within the day for those kids to travel between classrooms, where in a typical elementary, it might just be one core teacher, and that's their homeroom, and that's kind of where they get all their core. In a five-six structure, we're, we're partnering that. It's a two-person team. Um, if we need to do a three-person team because we have an odd number of sections in the grade, then there might be one section of three-person team, and, and that would be unique. Um, when that situation would arise. Um, those are really the, the main ones that I could think of that would really set it apart and different from an elementary. One follow-up question. Yes, Sorry, what are absolutely. The, you know, student clubs and organizations for students outside of the curriculum in the day? Yes, like we currently have clubs after school. We had to kind of shut a lot of that down recently, but um, yes, I could see continuing clubs. Um, some of this would 
you know, be contingent to on just teachers that are willing to supervise and do that. We've had that in the past where um, a lot of times it's student driven. Um, I've had students come up to me in the past and say, hey, we want to have a, a club. And I said, well, you got to find someone to supervise you. Uh, and put that back on them. And, and a lot of times the teachers are pretty open to that. Like we've had chess club and, and it might just be once a week. It might be scheduled when there's a shuttle bus. So for those kids that live in Grimes and they need to get a ride on a bus. Um, but I could see clubs and things like that being a big part of, of the five, six, um, especially down the road. I think, you know, initially we want to get it open, make sure we have everything happening within the school day. Um, but the one thing that's nice about um, the Dallas Center campus is we have space. Um, so even outdoor type activities when the weather's nice, to be able to spread out. Um, and with the new pod that's being added and the, the openness of the lunchroom and some of those spaces um, will be will lend themselves nicely, I think, to club type things where kids will be able to spread out um, and not be crowded. So I yeah, I would look forward to to those opportunities for those kids too. Insurance is I can hear about. Gary, this is Mark. I, your building has some really strong traditions of service learning opportunities. So your makeup of the building is different. Would you be able to continue on the spirit of some of those? Yeah, um, boy, I, I, I agree with you. I, I've experienced that firsthand um, and, and what that looks like. Um, I would hope we could. Um, a lot of that has to do with just the leadership of being able to organize it. Um, we've had a student council um, in a 6-7, and, and we used to have it too in the 6-8. Um, that would be a discussion too of, of what would that look like in a 5-6 setting, and, and when would be a time for that age of kids to, to organize. Um, that is one of the joys of middle school, is watching kids take ownership of topics, whether it's Veterans Day or, or you know, uh, Spurgeon Manor, adopt a, a grandparent, things like that. Um, I think, again, Dallas Center is unique in, in its location and some of the things and traditions that are there. So it's really just a matter of having staff and, and the leadership to organize it, but then also to kind of step back and say, you know, what is, what's most appropriate for a fifth and sixth grade student in their school day? So but I appreciate that question. Thank you. Any other questions? If I, if I could just share one last thing I, before I, I call it. Um, I think during this time of, of year and, and this time in our, in our community, <coughs> we have to look for ways to thank people uh, and find new ways to thank people. And, and it's been important for me as I've gone into the school year to just reach out to as many people as I can to thank them. Um, and so I would, I would like to just take this opportunity in my way to thank all of you board members um, for the service that you provide to our school district. Um, I know it's, it's not an easy job. Um, you might say it's a thankless job, but, but in a spirit of Thanksgiving this week, um, I'd like to share something with, with all of you. And it's something uh, that I've shared with my students. I've shared it with staff in my building, and I just feel like tonight might be a good night to share it with you. Um, it's a poem called Impossible is Possible, and I wrote it in September, and so now I share it with you. Today is the day to give thanks and give praise. Keep watch, be ready for the spirit to raise. With eyes wide open, ears longing to hear, Slowly but surely, love's presence draws near. It whispers our names, so soft yet so clear. I love you, I'm with you, there's nothing to fear. I'll show you the way how to reap what you sow. Believe and receive the power to grow. So we go and we sow, we say yes, we say no. The power of love is the power to grow. Who knew that love's power empowers us so? Give thanks and give praise for the wisdom to know. Love is great beyond measure and does impossible things. Dream big with me, friends, and see what love brings. 
I just want to thank all of you and a happy Thanksgiving, everyone. So if a student would take chemistry one as a freshman, 
and then physics one as that freshman, they, as they progress, as they realize that they have a need or a desire for advanced sciences based on what they would like to do after high school, there would be a chemistry two and a physics two, which if you can see are listed in that elective box. So they could have that year of chemistry if they so choose a need. They would also have the um, ability to take other sciences that may be more applicable to what they would like to do after high school. So in that second page, it talks about kind of some of the rationale. Um, again, 912 science teachers worked on this, talked about what that would look like, the need, where we see um, a need for a little more stronger, deeper knowledge of mathematics in order to continue on through some science courses. For the state of Iowa, we are expected to have um, the science standards in place for full implementation um, already. And so we are working to have that and hopefully we would be able to do that next year with your approval later tonight. Knowing that adding a course also at times adds resources. So if we begin the chemistry and the physics, chemistry one and physics one course in 21-22, our resources we have now can be used. If you notice the earth and environmental science wouldn't begin until the 22-23 school year as students progress through this pathway. Allows us a little more time to make sure we have the resources, um, money, resources, in order to purchase the needed materials and resources for that course. What questions might you have? I, uh, this is Kathy. I just have a question uh, just in my head thinking about, so if a student were to, uh, I just like it to students that I've known that have maybe jumped right into AP Bio or, or uh, Physics or Chemistry, is that then an option and does it meet the guidelines or do they take these and then have less room to take the AP classes? They would still have, so chemistry and physics, chemistry one and physics one would be that immediate course as, as the freshman. Um, that bio, they could still do the AP bio as their sophomore year opposite. I, we just didn't list that, that as that, that trade. Um, we actually did not talk about what that would look like for AP physics, they would end up having seven credits, you know, if they would take that IP class. They would have seven credits of science um, at that point. That would be the choice elective of, of, I'll say, continuing into advanced coursework in science rather than just taking your one credit elective and being done with their six credits. So if their thought was that they would take AP physics, they would essentially be taking, they'd have to take the six plus. I'm sorry. They, they would have to. I'm sorry. Let me take this out. They would have to take physics one. Yes. No matter what, even mm -hmm. if they know they're going to take AP physics. Physics one is would be the equivalent to all say of that piece of the foundations. It's also in that reconfiguration of, of making sure the standards are there. We're needing to have rather than a year long physical science. They they know that there could be some chemistry standards and skills taught in that freshman year so that builds that foundation for students who want to take that second semester of chemistry. We don't always have um, students who continue the year chemistry course at times because it's a two semester. We do have students who choose a semester of chemistry and don't always take that second credit of chemistry. Thank you. I think, can I just follow up on that? I felt like I had the same question. Maybe I would just ask you just a little different, which is, is there a repetition then? So if you take Chem 1 and then you take AP Chemistry, which is a two-credit course, are you repeating 
a semester of chem one? No. You, okay. It would be, so our, our conversation is that chemistry is our foundation chemistry to give you the skills and, and content you need to make sure that you have the skills. Also, you will have built the math along the way, so the mathematics you need for that either second semester of chemistry or the AP chem. And maybe then I would just follow up. <laughs> um, will there be, maybe with an extended um, learning plan, if there are students who it wouldn't make sense, who it would maybe make sense to accelerate in that area, is that an option that could be looked at and would they still meet the requirements? I mean, I'm just thinking about students who may not take, currently, I believe there might be students who jump right to advanced, who to, uh, jump right to AP Chem or AP Bio um, or AP Physics and don't currently take those other courses. And so is that, does that continue to be an option for those students who may need that? We would absolutely work with students who had an individual need as for acceleration as we would needing just that assistance maybe for foundational skills as well. But yes, we can look at that as a case by case basis and have that option. Okay, thank you. That helps a lot for me. Thanks. Jill, just to confirm that your this model would not require um, any additional staff we're able to cover with current staff, but you said that, just wanted to confirm it. So I don't think I said that loud, but you are correct. Okay. Our current staff can um, teach this pathway. In fact, we talked about um, when we look at hiring, so <coughs> in the future, if we would have the opportunity or need for a science teacher, any content teacher. When we look at what we're needing, we're gonna take a look at what is the best endorsement package that we would like to see in candidates. So right now, there are a variety of science offering, or, sorry, endorsements. Some people only have chemistry, some biological, some have all science. Our intent is we look to build the district and our capacity. We would want to be looking for all, all science endorsements to help us with, with the load for our teachers as well. that is 
more accurately reflecting current um, state guidance and requirements. I've got two questions. One was, can you talk just a little bit about the difference between the core and the regular diploma? And then, um, just is any student eligible for the core diploma, or how do you how do you make those decisions? Yeah, great question. Districts who offer more than one diploma, it is required to be offered to any student. So, multiple diplomas in a district are available to all students who attend and will graduate from our district. The district um, issues diplomas. So our core diploma, if we were to be moving to that word, core diploma requires the exact same requirements, the core requirements, as our regular diploma. Same number of math, science, social studies, English language, our financial literacy, health, the PE, CPR, all of those things are the same. The difference would be in the number of electives core diploma has seven, a regular diploma would have 17. There would be 10 fewer electives required for a core diploma. That would be the only difference, is the number of electives. Regular, all the four additional electives, and then the honors, additional course work beyond a regular diploma. I would just say that I appreciate the name change to court. I like it. Any other questions that I can help you with? All right. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. within the district. Uh, we continue to grow with single family um, housing permits. We have six new. Uh, this brings us to a total of 76 permits for the last four months. Uh, this is about 22 from last year. So we do see growth within our district. Uh, the next major item is the COVID-19 update. Um, I have a list of kind of big areas um, to discuss. Uh, Mrs. Van Workham and myself will be going through this COVID-19 update. Uh, the main uh, first topic is talking about technology, PK-5. So at this point, we have um, secured the 850 devices. Uh, those have been um, set up and handed out. Uh, we were able to then also have enough devices for Chromebooks to be able to bring it down to second grade. Uh, so original plan for the district was three, five Chromebooks. We were able to actually move Chromebooks down to second grade. Those have been uh, dispersed um, as long as parents have filled out their waiver uh, for the technology. Uh, we've also secured or look not secured but repurposed uh, iPads for kindergarten through first grade as well as preschool. Um, we're looking at those being dispersed uh, when we come back. after break, so Monday the 30th. In doing with anything you hand out with new technology, um, this is kind of part of the hybrid learning as well as full off-site. Uh, with that technology comes some shift and change and some um, new learning for our staff and also some expectations that we believe we need to make sure that we're um, using the technology to help support our learning. Um, whether that learning is full off-site, hybrid model, um, or actually when we come back, five days a week um, in person in the future. Um, that's the technology update is really more about the devices and the rollout. Um, we'll probably talk more about technology when it comes out of hybrid learning or full um, off-site. Uh, the next item was kind of updating the, unless you had other questions about technology. 
Uh, we do have um, also. Yes, yeah, just, just Ryan, just quick clarification. Yeah. Now, I, I think initially the PK through first grade, not every kid was getting an iPad, right? I mean, it was just, was there some kind of survey that went out that they needed an iPad? We were getting yeah, we, an iPad, but, but we weren't doing it for every, every kid necessarily. Correct. And actually, the original plan for the 850 was really for on site learning. Uh, that was for check out, check in during the day. Um, it was actually to prepare us so if we had to go full off site, those devices would be available for us to do that. Um, we decided to push that um, up and just get the devices in students' hands um, and have them go back and forth as well. It helps support learning at home. The iPad was really set out to support K2 um, to begin with, with having a device that needed from the family to be able to check out or send home. <clears throat> we do have enough devices um, to be able to hand those out to all families who would be interested in having a device come home and back to school. Um, and then also down in preschool. For that to work. We are purchasing some iPad devices for preschool as well to help support some of that shift um, and we'll be having the devices on site for that to happen. We still have other devices on site because um, we always need to have a, uh, a number so that if a family needed to trade one in or have it repaired um, we can have that done as well. It is, I just have to reiterate, I understand the pressure that we have with technology, but I go back to when we first rolled out computers to our eighth grade class. I believe that was my first year in the district. And we were concerned about handing out an iPad to an eighth grader without getting damaged to and from school. That was the initial conversation. Do we trust and do we hold back? And my answer then, as it probably would be now, is these kids can probably handle devices better than we can. And I think it's the adults that might have more of a concern of the use of technology with our students um, and sometimes that hesitation. But um, we know that with our difficult time now, and we know that there's some families that need those devices day in and day out, and we want to build providers to support those um, as we move forward with whatever learning model we are in. Um, I also go back to eighth grade laptops coming out to begin with. I think that was like a three year study before that was even implemented. Uh, this was like a seven month study um, to try to implement and um, you know, I, I want to encourage and provide uh, grace to our teachers as well as our administration um, for what is they are embarking on and the supports that they're going to need as well as um, providing them time for training and it's a new learning for them. Um, not only are we taking some students out of class and connecting online, we're now asking staff to go above and beyond and prepare online learning in a sense with a level of training that we haven't had time to be able to provide um, to the level that we would like for those teachers um, and staff. Any other questions on just the technology device itself? Uh, COVID monitoring data, um, the information that we uh, look out daily and then we provide out month or weekly. Uh, we're kind of looking at the percentages and the percentages even from last Wednesday to today. Uh, Dallas County last Wednesday was 21%. It's right now, I believe, under 19. Polk County was 20.1%, right now it's under 19. Um, looking at confirmed positive cases, we're looking at 24 total student cases in that week, and six staff for a total of 30. And the week before we had a total of 33 um, isolated confirmed positive cases within our district. Our quarantine numbers, um, 14 days due to exposure, whether that's in district or out of district. Um, the week before was 159 total, uh, 19 staff, 140 students, 159 total staff and students, and then last week 
there's 216 that's comprised of 23 staff members and 193 students. Our absentee rate for students still sits within our district at 3.05. Uh, that can be broke down by building, but I think if you look at seven buildings, uh, the average is around 3.05. There's no real fluctuation. That one building is a lot higher than another building. Um, I added the weekly staff absent rate um, because this is another question or I would say a big factor that we look at when it comes down to if we can actually um, support the buildings. Uh, we have 400 or 449 staff in the district um, that support our district day in and day out. Uh, two weeks ago, we were about 6% absentee rate for our staff. Uh, two weeks ago, it was 9.87, and then last week it went over 10.36. Other districts, as I meet with them weekly, and they talk about the rationale of why they're uh, moving to full remote or in-person or why a grade is going down or why a classroom is, a majority of that has to do with staffing to be able to keep the building open. Um, some other districts that have moved to either a partial online or full remote online, their staff percentage was getting around 12 to 13% out. They initially thought it was going to be 20%, but they found, they found, and we talked last month, or last meeting, it really depends on where it falls, um, and what department, or what grade, or what building. Uh, so we're sitting at 10.36 um, as a, another factor that we will monitor within that. And that's also a, a conversation we've had as a cabinet team. Uh, just talking about, and this kind of comes down to uh, kind of talking about what model we would recommend going forward after winter or after uh, Thanksgiving break. Um, with talking with the cabinet, uh, the staff within the district and the administration, or the administrative staff, uh, we believe that um, we're able to support that current absentee rate and it could probably support more absentee rates uh, within our district. From what we're seeing, um, covering the classes, uh, we've had staff teach from home remotely. We've had coverage of those classrooms with certified staff, licensed staff, as well as that teacher teaching from home for whatever reason we were home for. Uh, we've also had staff cover other classrooms. We've had associate. Uh, Good sub pool uh, that they are comfortable coming in in a hybrid classroom versus a full online or full on site classroom. Uh, so they are also asking the same question others are with staff is what model are you moving forward with and will I be able to support the district as we, as we move forward? That goes a little bit into kind of the data pieces. I know we can break this down, slice and dice it in many different ways. Uh, we can pinpoint areas. And I know that our community, as well as our staff, as well as the school board, um, you know, we all look at data differently and each of it represents a little bit of piece of what they're looking at or how it's connected. Uh, we're finding out with conversations with other districts as well as our own that confirmed positive cases, the quarantine numbers, but more importantly, the student absent rate and the staff absent rate probably gives us the most data and information on whether we can maintain moving forward. Um, I would say that even possibly goes over the positivity rates within our counties um, if we want to localize it down to our own district. Any questions on the data? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe it's the question I get the most or the observation that's made the most to me from the community, which is, wow, the, your numbers are horrible in the school district. Um, are kids safe in school, I think is the question I have. So can you talk a little bit about where we see the, the spread? Is it 
in the schools or is it in the community where you see large isolation numbers and large quarantine numbers? When you look at our positive, our, I, want, I can't say positivity rate because that is a calculated differently than just the positive numbers within our school. Um, with our positive rates, let's say we go two weeks ago, 11-11, we had 33 um, students and staff that were tested positive that week. We had 159 students quarantined. We know that 33 staff and students did not accommodate for 159 students and staff being quarantined. What we saw was those numbers, positive numbers, stay about the same, if not decrease the following week, 1118. But our quarantine numbers jumped to 216. So that is telling us that we have more commun community spread, family spread, outside of the districts than what we're seeing in the districts. We can isolate that number down and what students are being quarantined because of positive in the school and what students are being quarantined because of other factors or other events outside of our school. So my answer would be we're seeing more community spread with our positive or with our quarantine numbers than just in the building. I guess I'm just interested in making sure that the community feels that their students are safe at school for whenever we bring them back on site. They still say that that's how you look at it. We're mask to mask. It's required. Students are here eight days a week or eight hours a day five days a week. Um, mask to mask does show and reduce chances of spread. We have mask to mask students that are watching for symptoms versus being quarantined. And we're not seeing those individuals test positive or change. Same thing with our quarantine numbers. We're not seeing those quarantine numbers shift into a positive due to being quarantined from exposure to school. People would say then we have more control at school, sending students here, being mask to mask than the environments possibly they're in when they're outside of the school district. It still comes down to staffing at that point and whether we can staff the population, whether it's a hybrid or five days a week, it's still gonna come down to staffing is our biggest concern. because there are districts that are five days a week with online option that are moving to remote or, or online also. When I meet with superintendents weekly, it's about 46 different superintendents. We discuss numbers, we discuss communication, we discuss differences of our districts and the challenges that we each have is differently. I'm learning more and more that it doesn't matter your size, or where you're located, you're still going to come down to your student positivity rate to, to look at in your staff. And if you cannot staff a district or a building, whether you have a thousand students or twelve thousand students, it comes down to staffing and be able to maintain your doors open. Scott, this is Ryan. Can you just comment back on the staff working remotely and of the maybe just make sure? Is that the quarantine group, and if they are working with them, is it more of a support role to a substitute, or how does that work? So we have um, so we have staff that, if quarantined or they're off-site, understand we cannot identify what staff have been quarantined, nor can we identify which staff has been positive. So when we have staff working remotely for one reason or another. We have a substitute, we either hire a substitute or a teacher that supports the classroom with technology, um, just management of the classroom. And that is a 
choice of a teacher um, at home on their willingness to want to support that class from a distance. The majority of our teachers have chose, if they can, to teach remotely while the class is in the classroom. I mean, they want, to, they want to be part of their classroom. They want to support it. So as a district, we're providing them that opportunity that does change their leave, um, depending on what they're able to provide and support. We're learning a lot from COVID-19 in the end about remote learning. We're learning a lot about remote teaching. Um, and I would say the flexibility of our staff to make things work for their class. They want to be in the classroom, the staff. The students want to be in the classroom. So that's their willingness will be served by itself to cover the class. Is that correct? The cost of that. That is correct. But we have had some classrooms where we have not been able to fill a sub, but we were able to um, choose either not to offer that class for the day or have the students work on something else during that period. Understand we have that on a normal school year, not even COVID related, we have those instances. So there's times that we don't have enough subs in a regular year to cover, let alone the COVID-19 year. Scott, this is Sarah. One of the pieces of information we asked last time was kind of an update on our student performances overall. Um, we continue to get some feedback from families wanting to know uh, how they know if their student is being successful in the classroom. Um, so just curious if you have any more information for us um, as a board that we can reflect upon about hy hybrid performance. And perhaps Jill can help answer this question. We had I know that has been a question of the board, and we've had some specific kind of questions about what does that look like. Some of the questions that were asked of, of us in our admin and we in our admin team meetings, we have talked about what does that look like. So we've talked about the number of students who have been um, who are being progress monitored. So we talked about that fast test that came quick in September, and then our next test would be in. January and that really is a nice measure as we've had students in our classrooms we've had them with us as opposed to having that break of time from March until August and so one of the questions that was asked is how many students in the district are being progress monitored this fall and the number of dis uh, students in the district who were progress monitored last fall Right now, we have about 500 students being progress monitored this fall, and last fall we were about 275 to 80. Of those students who are being progress monitored this year, 304 of them were also progress monitored last fall. Students who would be new to our progress monitoring that didn't have progress monitoring last year, would be about 200. This is K-6. The other question that, that came to us was, in that number, in those number of students who are new to progress monitoring, out of those 200, a little over 200, 51 of those currently may not be having an upward trend, trend line in their learning. So that's a case six look at our current, we'll say, assessment that we have our the availability to on, on a regular basis for literacy. At the secondary level. Hey, Joe, before you move on, yes. this line, I just want to make sure I've got these numbers down right. You said this fall we're at 500. You said last fall we were between 270 and 280. And then you referenced back to the 500 and said the 303 were progress monitored last fall. So I'm trying to make a connection there with that map. If we only had 280 progress monitored last fall, then how could we have 303 of the 500? So, do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Thanks. So, 
So with the progress monitoring, I cannot, I, I'm sorry, I cannot tell you specifically. So the number of students being progress monitored this fall of that 511, um, 304 were progress monitored last year. Those aren't the same students. I mean, you may have, this, you may have a student who is there last year, new this year, that trade. We also have new kindergarten students that come in that we may not have taken an account for. It's very, but it, I only smiled at that, Ryan, because when we looked at this, one of the statements was, maybe we should make sure that all of the numbers equal the 511. And so I, when you said that, I smiled at that. Mm -hmm. But current numbers from our buildings, um, those were what we had, and I, I honestly, I can't speak to the difference <coughs> when I'm looking at the numbers that we, keep, that we have from the building that difference. Thank you. No, well, I, you're welcome. I'm sorry, that was a non-answer for you. But I think with the current numbers, and we can get clarification tomorrow in our meeting, Brian and I can certainly email that to all of you if you need and want that. Um, but our current numbers in those who are new, which is that conversation when we had students who hadn't had direct instruction from March until September, having them assessed and then having 200 students who would be new to this process of, of being identified as needing a little more support in reading and then having 51 of those 207 students not having that upper trend line, um, in my opinion, pretty impressive for the work that we have been doing since September to November with our students when we've had them in a hybrid model. And when I say us, that's not me. That's our classroom and teachers and our interventionists um, and special ed teachers as well. Secondary middle school. When they talk about what that might look like to identify where students are at in their learning, they have what they, it's an SRI, it's a um, scholastic reading inventory, so it's a reading assessment. In 2019, 68% scored in the proficient range. I'm sorry, currently 68% are scoring in the proficient range. For last year, there were 52% scoring in the proficient range. In their AMAP, they had 86 scoring in the proficient range. Last year, 86. So they are, are equal in that percentage scoring in the proficient range for that, for that AMAP assessment that we give. Current sixth graders, because we don't have their data from last year, SRI is not an assessment that's given in fifth grade. 50% of the sixth graders are scoring in the proficient range on their reading test, that SRI, and 77% are proficient in the AMAP. Those are our new sixth graders this year. Meadows is looking at their, their SRI as well. 80% of the ninth graders were in the proficient range this fall. Last fall, 79%. This year's eighth graders on the SRI, 78% of them in the proficient range. And the seventh graders, 73% of them were in the proficient range. Sorry, Jelly. Did you say that the last stat was seventh or eighth graders? It's a progression. So oh, this year's you. ninth graders. Thank you. And then this year's seventh graders. Or excuse me, this year's eighth graders. And could you just throw those percentages out again? I'm sorry. Yes. The ninth graders, so in eighth grade they were at? In eighth grade they were 79%. <clears throat> and then as ninth graders they were 80%. So just a, that one percent. 
and then as seventh graders, we had 73%, and our current eighth graders in this fall were at 78%, 73 to 78. They will use um, AMAS as well for their, for their scores, but they will also look at unit scores in mathematics from last year to this year as far as what they are looking at is academic progress for our Meadows, eighth and ninth graders. High school um, has a spreadsheet that they keep track of um, the information for their students, talking about the four core areas, so English language, math, science, social studies, and the grades from September, excuse me, the grades from November 17th, specifically, but in 2020. And then they also have grade comparisons for the entire building in those, in those dates. One of the things that at that secondary level, because there is not a universal assessment except for our Iowa assessment, our ISAS, which we did not have last spring. We use, at that secondary level, especially 10, 12 building, we use what we have in place for unit in assessments, more, I'll say, comparable to our series. So what are we, what are we having them assessed on after we have a unit of instruction? So it's our creation of assessments but it's pretty consistent because we, we are the people, we are the keeper. We've built it and we have it in place and we know what that looks like. But they have made that, that statement, which I appreciate too in, in the notes of, you know, looking at that comparison, definitely taking with a grain of salt. Um, you don't have apples to apples because your instruction last year, changing to the instruction of this year, making sure we're compacting our curriculum to make to make sure our students are getting what they need to continue to be successful to move on and especially to be successful and have the foundation to move into a second semester class that they may need a little more ground um, groundwork being laid in that short amount of time. Um, I do want to talk about the anecdotal data which would accompany especially a 10 12 building with that kind of conversation about assessments. 10, 12 teachers have been meeting and talking, not only in their PLCs, but in the BLT. Their, their building leadership team has talked, has brought that information from their PLCs and talked about that teachers really are believing and having that evidence and seeing the students really are accomplishing the necessary standards um, that are, are needed. They're also unable to get into some of the additional materials. So we talked a lot about, um, when we talk about needing things, we talk about nicety versus necessity. And that application is still true at that secondary level. So while they may have spent a little more time in this area and to have something that's nice to expand upon, nice maybe to have an activity that you would do on the third day of this, they're not, they're not looking at this. They're looking at what is necessary, and we are providing that. Um, and we may not have as much time for a nicety to accompany the necessity. to the, the board and gave their board report on, on what they were doing too. 
they talked about the ability to work with staff, excuse me, the ability of their staff to be able to work with students at a deeper level because you will have you work with you at any time. The ability that they have to move through standards and teaching has been beneficial in our model. The fact that we have 50, 51, just over 50 students, that we aren't seeing an exact upward trend line out of all of our, I mean, I realized what we, we, the question was, how many of our new progress monitored students? But really what we're looking at is there are 51 K-6 that don't have an upward trend of all, all of our K-5, K-6 students. And they sat out from March until the end of August without direct instruction from a teacher. I think that's commendable um, on the parts of not only our staff, our classroom teachers, our interventionists, everybody working with those students, but it's commendable for parents as well and families because they know that there was some time that they were without direct instruction. And they too, I'm sure, are looking and knowing, hey, here are some things that we need to do for our own children to help um, the success of their academics this school year. So it's it's very, very exciting to, to hear this. Mrs. Cale talked about this on Wednesdays, um, up until this last Wednesday. They are working in groups to talk about the students. They have, um, I think even in the board report, some of you saw in a couple of the buildings, that data is used. Um, they, they are looking at that, they're marking that, they are putting data into those um, charts and to work with staff about what it looks like and to regroup students. And sooner than we can imagine, January is gonna roll around again and we're gonna have winter testing for that fast season. And that would be exciting to see how we were able, when we have actual, are, are able to have control of, of our bodies, of little ones from <coughs> September until January, what that can look like for growth for them. Okay, Jill, Trent, just a quick question, and I don't mean to keep picking on this 500 number, but just some quick math, that's about an 85% increase over last year's number. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's great that we have um, you know, we've got most of those kids in a, in a trend that's up and to the right, um, but nevertheless, that's, that's a substantive increase over last year. And so kind of the comments you, you just made, how do you kind of square that with the, with the increase that we have, and, and what do you think's in that number, and, and why are we seeing the kind of increase last year to this that we're seeing? I might follow up on that with just a follow-up question that may help clarify that. Were those students chosen after the initial fall fast in September for intervention? Our 300 or the number that are in intervention now, have they are they chosen after the initial fast intervention yes. in September? Yes. So they were chosen after the long term of no instruction. Yes. So yeah, our increase is we have more students that are receiving additional support in reading than, than we have had in the past because we truly know and believe because they did not have that direct instruction from March until the first part of September in the fall. Um, in the past, at times, and in, in, in no, I'm sure there is a little summer slide that happens for some, not all, but when you don't have that consistent learning even happening over summer, we do see some of that happen with students. It's interesting um, because for us, we have our numbers and we know the percentage of students who were at benchmark in the fall, this fall. We also know what our benchmark data looks like last fall. Our benchmark data last fall for our elementary students and sixth grade, because we have that um, higher last fall than this fall. It's very interesting. We were, con you know, I'm a bit. We were contacted by um, 
another metro school saying, our board is talking to us about academics and how, how do we know and how are we um, assessing students to know how if we're making progress. They too have experienced lower numbers, fewer students were benchmarked in the fall, and they asked for data from metro districts. All names were hidden and protected and things like that. And they are, they have that comparison that they have to their board to say, while we are not where we were last fall and we are not where we would like to be, this is happening across the metro, across Iowa, but happening across the metro. And this is what we are doing. Just the same things that, that we have shared that Mrs. Morris and Mrs. Hale have shared in their reports about how we are trying to make up ground and we believe we're doing a very good job of that for the majority. We will always have a percentage that we need to pay attention to and support academically to enrich and give foundation to. So can you talk a little, this is Sarah again, can you talk a little bit about what we do specifically for those 51 students? Because I, I, I'm curious mm -hmm. um, to know what families can expect. You know, every building has a little, their own specific intervention and classroom support. So if a student is needing additional support from what we will call the core, so every student sitting in a classroom has the same, they get, a, they get the meal. And then if they need additional and they have, are in need of a snack, and what does that look like? Do they receive some additional support from a reading interventionist? Do they receive um, some additional support from a special education teacher? Do they receive additional support from both? And so depending on what you need as a student, you may have your core instruction from your classroom teacher, but then there may be a classroom intervention that happens because we see that our classroom maybe falls below a certain percentage of students who are benchmarked. So it may be a second grade classroom that's receiving a class-wide intervention. But my neighbor, second grade, right now they were above that threshold, so they don't need that class-wide intervention. There may be then in those classrooms students who need additional support outside the classroom and the classroom class-wide intervention they would maybe then go to a reading interventionist. There's additional time to support reading needs. From there, if there's additional support needed, that student may benefit from some specially designed instruction in the area of reading, literacy, or math with a special education teacher. And if they need additional support, they may have time with a special education teacher and an interventionist. Our elementary buildings really build on here's the data and how do we design instruction to match. So those will be some of the ways I know our elementary Thank you. are serving. going back to the data. We've had lots of questions about um, transparency and about the numbers. And so I just want to clarify, we as a board have a weekly chart. Are all cases of positive, so the weekly number that we get for a week, that's a cumulative, that's not the number on that day. So that chart includes all positives and all quarantines. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And then I would like to ask if, if it's at all possible to show, to add to that, um, because I look at the website also, and it gives us one data point, but unless you look at it and write it down every week, it's really not giving a picture. And I know you've added total numbers, and I appreciate that. I just saw that this week. Is there a way at all to do a graph on there just of the total numbers of quarantine and positives, just two small graphs that could be added? 
to just see a trend line? Because I, I know I sent out in a lot of my emails this week to say the numbers are increasing because people have said they can't tell from looking at one week's work if they haven't looked and kept track in their heads. So I'm just curious how hard that would be to add um, an ongoing graph of those numbers uh, of the totals, not by building, but just the totals so that people can see that data. Yeah, we can just take the chart that is shared with the board and then we use administrative labor. We just pull those columns out and go back. I think that that might help people feel like we're having more transparency because I know we're seeing those numbers, um, but the community isn't. They are now seeing them, but one week at a time, and that's just hard to see a trend if, if, you're, if you have to do it in your own mind. Um, so thank you. That would be a great add if we can. Um, I also had a question back to quarantining and teachers teaching remotely. I know that on the plan that has come, it has said that teachers can be considered critical personnel and required to come in. Have we have have we had to do any of that or even consider any of that or as a district are we? I'm not saying we should. I just know that it's written in that plan that they, that, that can be requested. It can be requested. We've only looked at it kind of up to the point of where we can cover or not. I mean, if we can, if an individual needs to be quarantined, staff or student at this point, we feel it's best that they quarantine outside of the district. The essential employees is the question you have and a board could go through and um, a superintendent could go through and deem essential employees to have them come back earlier than the quarantine time. At this point, we have been able to either support externally or to be able to fill those positions at this time. So we have not deemed any essential workers to come back earlier during the quarantine rather than 10 days or if they test positive or 14 days if their last contact with a positive case. Did that answer your question? It does, and I appreciate that answer. So back to when we touched on some of the hybrid learning full offsite, uh, we talked specifically about the hybrid learning or if you had specific questions on the hybrid learning piece. Uh, now that we have devices going out. Um, this is Kathy. I do have a couple of course of me, sorry. <laughs> um, Two questions. I'm guessing, and this is a learning curve situation, and I think that you addressed it, but I just know we have lots of questions about the rigor of the learning on the virtual days. I'm hopeful that that has been part of the staff discussion with devices going out, that some of that may become more rigorous or at least more opportunities for, um, for teaching of some type or, or different types of activities for those students. Is that correct? <coughs> That is correct. Um, I think what we also need to remember is that the staff that are sitting in front of group A is also teaching group B. And I think what's happening is part of the perception is, is those teachers could provide, have extra time to help support either recorded or live sessions for the students that are offsite. Um, they're teaching that full day. Um, we provided them an early out on Wednesday to try to do some of that either recording or lessons for the A group or B group who's ever on site as well as off site um, for those days. Uh, we do know that we have identified as we uh, work with the buildings um, and provide some, some training and also some um, kind of ideas or expectations to help support off site days as well as on site days. But it does take time and those teachers are, are teaching all week um, with the students in front of them and then being expected also to teach off week um, or for the students that are off site as well. That is also what I'm finding in conversations I've had is we are also being compared to districts that are five days a week. We're being compared to districts that are full on site when a classroom were to be, and this is kind of talking about the full off site, but if we identify a classroom that needs to be quarantined for 14 days, uh, they'll still manage the same schedule. 
So the A days would could expect live lessons with that teacher on Monday and Tuesday, and the B classes would still be expected on like live teaching on the B days, Thursdays and Wednesdays, or Thursdays and Fridays. We would not be combining the class, A's and B's and going five days a week, when it's by class or by building. Um, and I just, I think those are some of the things that is, is perception versus reality of what we can do. Um, if we do need to go full offsite, and when I talk about full offsite remote learning, this is the examples that people are applying for waivers for, for the district. That is when we would look at five days a week, A and B combined for those 14 days of the full waiver. Um, but when it comes down to a building or a classroom, we need to maintain that A-B schedule as it aligns with other schedules in that family. And it may align with other students within the districts that need to stay that A and B alignment as well. Easier said than done. And I do know what the expectation is. And we want to be able to provide that expectation the best we can. And we want to be able to do it with the staff we have and with the training and development that um, allows them to be successful in that learning and teaching. Our teachers do not want to be put in situations that they feel like they're not trained or that they don't want to fail at it. I mean, they want to do the best they can for these kids. And when you listen to the numbers that were given, um, I think you probably notice there's growth that's happening um, that I think we need to identify and, and support for our teachers as well and staff. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. It, and it really was a question. I mean, I think- Try to answer a few other things at the same time. We're all striving to do better. Um, so the, one other question that has come up in several emails from families is that if the, we do continue in person in hybrid and there are families who would like to consider going online, um, is that still case by case? How are those decided um, at this point if they would like to switch to online uh, for the rest of the semester or longer? So we discussed uh, the cabinet last week and as well as the administrative team, and I think I've given this answer a number of times, uh, we will work with any family who either needs to move off-site to online or online, no, that was the same thing, in-person to online or online to in-person. Um, that is case by case. It typically is connected around medical conditions at this point or medical need or change in family dynamics that may need to be able to support that for that time being. Um, but we will continue to uh, work with any family that we can um, one way or the other. But it's not as easy as, it's not, it, 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 there needs to be dialogue behind it. It's not a, as easy right now with schedule set, staffing set, online set. Um, every, every shift or change is a balance with everything else being successful. And we need to be able to manage that in the end. So yes, we can work with any family to help accommodate in the situation that that family is currently in. I think I'll follow, oh, sorry, go ahead. We're, was that it? Okay, sorry. Uh, so I guess just a follow-up question then, with the technology going home, what, changes do you guys see for the offsite days? Do you see any big changes? Do you see seesaw more? What do you guys hear? What have you guys been discussing as far as the changes that are going to be happening? I love that you have the seesaw dialogue now, Marco. <laughs> I, I thought spoke about this too with our teachers. We we have um, been a full professional development session last Wednesday, um, provided a template and a, and a format for that professional development. 
we're talking about elevating hybrid. That's, that's the words you're going to hear in the district about elevating hybrid with our, our devices. And on the 18th, we had that little time professional development. They learned about blended learning. What does that look like now with devices? We also received input. We asked for them to tell us what it looked like, felt like, sounded like, um, when that was happening. And we also received feedback of what do you need? Um, time and examples were our, were our largest response. And after the PD on Wednesday, we met, um, Lisa, Mary Jane, and myself, we met with instructional coaches, curriculum facilitators, and the um, substitute instructional coach at one of the buildings, who we sat together and talked about what that feedback looks like. What does that then lead us to need to build in order to have our staff com more comfortable with devices and how to use the devices with their students on their offsite days. I will reiterate, the question that has come up was, now that the devices are here and they are now in the hands of students, are we going to be expected to have something different digitally online for every single activity starting Monday? And we did have the conversation that it's elevating hybrid. So taking a look at what they're doing now, of the examples and so on, December 2, we have a plan, we have some things in place that will give them time, we'll give them examples. Everything we're looking at currently in elevating a hybrid can be used and implemented should we ever need to move to full online, either in a classroom, building, or district as well. So it's, that will do the things that they will have. So we did talk about elevating. So what are you doing now? What, what can you change and elevate in your hybrid for your students in the area of, of literacy next week? Is there a second thing that can be, can be elevated? We are trying to balance the need of and desire of our community and families to have something additional and not always paper pencil with the need and training and skill set of our staff. We've identified, as we've called them, the rock stars, um, people who are rocking digital platforms, and we've identified those staff in every building so we have a go-to. So when we're looking at, hey, I really know how to Zoom, but I don't know how to put our kids in breakout sessions. <laughs> How can I use a slideshow with Pear Deck for those students who are offsite so I have engagement and I'm getting information back from them in a timely manner rather than seeing something come back in an envelope on Monday? Um, if I can't say to you, Marco, tonight that we have identified that by next Monday afternoon that everybody will have four new things that they're sending home but the desire of our instructional coaches, our facilitators, our, as I'm referring to us, the school improvement team with Lisa, Mary Jane, myself, our building administrators, we want to elevate the hybrid. Our teachers want to do that as well. They want to do it well, and they want to be able to, to feel comfortable also in that. So it's that um, stretch a little bit, but it is our desire. And we, are trying to have everything, not everything, we're trying to have many things available in one place that they don't have to go find and dig. We'll have shared drives that they can go and pull examples for. Here are the digital resources for our Bridges Mathematics um, series that you can use now as opposed to digging through the many offerings. So we will have those things in place so teachers can go get them and then see how they can be applied in that in their off-site days. Sorry, I'm really passionate about health. They're just, they're working so hard and, and wanting to get this, this implemented as quickly as possible as well. I can't, I, there will be paper that will probably still trickle home in the next little bit, but our desire is to reduce that each, each time. Great, thank you. Next item, we 
talked about was full lot site. Um, I think I alluded to a little bit about that with the schedule, but you know, what full lot site will look like, uh, what our expectations would be for our staff, uh, what expectations we have for our families. Um, our goal is to not have to go to ever full off site remote learning. Um, last week, Middle on might have had a different conversation about full on site, uh, full off site learning. But right now, we're still looking at um, enhancing the hybrid and continuing with the hybrid model um, at least up to semester, would be our recommendation. So, uh, the full site, off site, we do have a plan. We are coming up with templates that uh, can be used um, if we were to need to shift and move to that. Some of the highlights for that, um, as I already talked about, would be the five days a week uh, kind of a schedule. Uh, we would have a template that elementary would use um, that would focus on the core classes being live. Uh, students would log in from home um, and follow through a, a similar schedule that they would have during the day. Uh, also providing work time during that time so they're not sitting on computers full time. Uh, we are concerned as well as probably families of, of unplugging, as I call it, with students and the staff are concerned about the amount of hours that they could be on if they were full off-site. Secondary would be more following their schedule um, as they would have currently. So, um, and they would log on to their class and go through their schedule similar to what they um, would be at on-site. Uh, that is change, you know, that is, that is learning because right now we are in a um, block schedule in our secondary. You move block schedule to full online, 90 minutes is different than when you're in person, 90 minutes. Um, their strengths to block in person and their strengths to in a period day in person and their strengths to block online and their strengths to make person day online. But we would not be shifting that. We would maintain the exact same schedule and calendar that we currently are in. It's still, I remind, coming back to, unless we see a full outbreak of students and our you know, county numbers as well as our impacting our staffing numbers would be the main reason for us to move from hybrid learning or five days a week learning to full up um, remote learning for the whole district or a building. Scott, knowing that our goal is to never have to do this, what is the process if we do have to consider it? If we do have to consider it, the state provides you a 24 hour grace period to allow you to two days, and I say two days to allow you to, um, you may need to put your, let's say we don't have staff to open a building up on, I don't, I'm not gonna say Monday the 30th, let's say Tuesday the, whatever that day is. Tuesday, and we can't open a building, we're able to move to full online remote for that building. And then we have that time to put a special board meeting together and to request a waiver to the state. Some districts have pre-approved, and that's not an action item here, but some districts knowing that they're possibly going to have a building in the future that's going to have to move to full remote, they may provide the superintendent the approval to apply for a waiver if these items are met. Um, but it still comes down to a special board meeting um, to discuss going full remote or requesting a waiver from the state for either a building or a full district. A classroom can be done at the district level. I think there are six board meetings tonight specifically discussing a waiver for the state of Iowa, other than ours. It kind of leads into other questions on full off-site and similar schedule template used 
live lessons, work time, attendance taken. Um, we would still be providing special ed services, interventions, uh, everything we provide on site, we would be providing externally um, through a schedule. And then to clarify that too, it would still be A's Monday, Tuesday, and then every other <coughs> Wednesday, and then B's Thursday, Friday, or if we were all off site. If it is classroom, we would continue hybrid schedule. If it was building, we'd continue hybrid schedule. If it was had to be off site. If it is full district, we would move to combining A's and B's and have them go through the schedule together. So a classroom teacher on full remote could have, um, their classes could be between 24 and 30 for their time that they're working with that class. Why is it only reserved for full district versus like building? Um, building wise, it comes down to family schedules um, and having kids in the upper grades and lower grades and it's just a coordination and scheduling for the families. Any more questions on the full on site? COVID-19 updates, let me see. Um, can I just ask a question for the full off site? Mm -hmm. um, in our return to learn plan, there were guidelines around how much um, maybe live engagement would be expected at different grades. Um, I would assume we would be following that. It wouldn't necessarily have kindergartners on a, on a screen from 8 until 3.15 or such that there would be levels perhaps of instruction that would happen. I mean, I've heard stories about online districts where honestly the elementary kids are on screens a lot more than the high school kids because high school kids check in at the start of their hour, have 20 or 30 minutes of instruction, and then they're done until their next hour, and it's happening differently. <coughs> and I'm just, I, I want our community to know what that might look like, and, and maybe that is something that we don't need to address. I just, I get concerned that if we have to make a switch, which I hope we won't, that that the expectations are reasonable developmentally for our kids too. So yeah, when, when we had the conversation with our admin team, um, we had kind of a draft plan of what that would look like for what we would call the temporary, so a classroom. <coughs> and knowing that in that instance, you could follow a schedule. So a third grader elementary student could follow that schedule of their day. So we have literacy at this time, there would be a break, we would have, they would have recess, they would have a break for a while. They would come back, they might have mathematics, they would have math. There could be a time in which then there would be art, and our teacher would then have that time. So at that elementary level, we did not address in a 90 minute literacy block, which doesn't have to be 90 minutes from start to finish, it can be 90 minutes throughout their, their day, where some of that may not be whole group. So there may be, like currently our online students, our DCG online students, have some whole group, small group work, um, sometimes individual, depending on what that the need is. So in that block of literacy, while they would follow their schedule, they may have time where these six maybe with the teacher, but the others have work that they know is related to English language arts and reading and writing, and then they have a break, and then there's another six. Um, the specificity of what that breakdown looks like, we did not get into the weeds of that yet. We've got the, the draft admin that looked at it, they shared it with their building, some of their building teams um, to provide that feedback as well as what it would look like for our additional students with um, reading or IEP 504 needs. Okay, thank you. So I have a question just about COVID-19 protocols. Is it appropriate to ask now or would you like me to? No, that's great. Okay, so one of the bits of feedback that I've been hearing is 
how we inform who needs to know if there's been a positive case in the classroom. And I understand that parents are informed of whether they've been exposed or whether they have to themselves quarantine. And I know that happens with the nurses. Uh, but can you talk with me a little bit about the, how staff are informed about students that are in their classroom? And I'm specifically curious about those teachers that might serve larger populations, like our encore teachers. How are they notified of the students that might be in their classroom? Or, or are they? And, and my, my premise here is that it sounds like there's concern that they don't get that information. Well, communication went out to the staff at the beginning of November, um, kind of aligned up with our uh, nurses. Um, as well as communication with the Diary Department of Public Health. Um, we also have a flow sheet, flow chart that we use. Um, when it comes down to notifying, um, it is the same whether you are a family externally or a student internally or a staff member internally. Um, if you meet within the six feet or you identify as close contact, um, of a student or another staff member, you're, you're notified through a letter that states you have been in close contact and you either need to quarantine or you need to monitor yourself. Um, we do not send out a, a list of names of students um, that violates, uh, I believe, HIPAA as well as other communication. Um, and so the only people that have access to those positive cases in a, in a district is myself. Um, the nurses, only one nurse has access to the whole district. Um, and then um, the building administrator is also informed of leaves or, um, I guess, not really specific all the cases, but kind of a need to know basis. This would be the same as a flu or a other illness. We can just not identify or give out information of those that are positive. And I can release that flow chart back out to the staff again. I believe it is on our website also. Um, that specifically talks about the steps that the average department of public health and our, um, our current uh, nursing staff in communicating that information out. So, so to clarify, if there's a student in your classroom that is isolated, a teacher wouldn't be notified that there's been a student in the classroom that is not isolated. If that student is gone, they would not know whether that student is gone for isolation purposes or just having the flu, or even if they were at a, a different situation or if they've been quarantined. It's not a feel-good answer, I'll be honest with that, but it's the answer we have to provide legally. Hey, can I ask a follow-up to that? Um, I know that the rule is masks and mask, masks worn appropriately. Is there an, ever discussion with teachers? Because I know that, uh, I mean, I work in schools, so I know that sometimes this happens a lot, and students are requested to put that back up, or it ends up around their chin, or, you know, or so I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious about that because that's assuming masks worn correctly, which I would think staff to staff, we can probably assume that that is primarily 100% of the time. But I think working with students, and if I'm with a student six hours and it's down below their nose, you know, two hours of that, three minutes at a time, that becomes a cumulative issue. So is there a follow-up with um, some staff, like maybe with some kids, some kids where the 100%, no issues, I got that, but there might be one or two kids per class who don't. And maybe that is, is there a question with teachers about, I mean, I know the kids that don't, and then maybe I have that list and admin has that list. Like this is the kid we're really working on trying to get that mask use 100%, but it isn't there. So if that student were to then test positive, and I know you can't give student names, but somehow the teachers know that, that perhaps there was a risk there. There was an improper use of mask to mask that is communicated between our health professionals and the Iowa Department of Public Health, and you would still be notified 
if the other person improperly wore their mask. So we have people that are quarantined due to a student not wearing their mask properly in the, in the school. So we do identify whether mask is being worn or not properly. We can tell them to wear the mask properly, but. Right, so if a teacher doesn't know why a student is gone, how would they report that maybe that is a student who doesn't always wear their mask appropriately? So Johnny test positive, he's gone. I'm his teacher, I don't know why he's gone. I just know he's gone. And, but I do know that Johnny doesn't always wear his mask appropriately. He's the one that I'm talking to every 30 minutes about putting it up above his nose. And so then that mask to mask has not been perhaps done correctly, but I don't know to tell my admin that. Or is that addressed somewhere else? I think it has to be addressed between the Iowa Department of Public Health and the nurse, and then communicating out either that staff member or people in the building. I don't know how to communicate it out without identifying a student. Yeah, and I think that is probably the concern of some staff members that we are getting emails from about not knowing because they don't know if uh, that mask example has not come up. It's just been more of a concern about not knowing um, if they have actually been um, appropriately protected through the current communication plan, which we may not have a lot of control over, but I'm wondering if everyone has a mask on perfectly, it's fine. I just know that kids don't always, and I don't know how to fix that or to address it, um, other than maybe communication I would bet right now every teacher could list out the kids in their class that they have some mask wearing concerns with and then having that list go to the nurse and then the nurse knowing if that nurse in the building is going to find out which kids are positive then they may be able to follow up on appropriate mask wear because they have the list. Just a thought. Take that into account and I'll talk to our nurses about that. Thank you. I'm so sorry to put another thing on the plate. It just. I understand. Working in schools, I understand because I also don't get contacted. And I also know kids aren't wearing their masks correctly. And frankly, sometimes in meetings, teachers aren't. And so I think that that becomes um, an assumption that if I was in a meeting with a teacher, I don't have to be notified. And yet, I know the teachers that don't wear their masks when they're in meetings with me. And so then that does make a difference. With all the information that's been provided, uh, the next topic is the return to learn educational model, November 30th. Um, understand the last meeting, um, we looked at uh, five days a week starting November or earlier than that. I uh, came to a meeting to extend hybrid um, up to November 24th and then coming back to November 30th with full on site. Uh, looking at the district information, uh, but shared tonight staffing uh, we would like to uh, the recommendation would be to continue the hybrid model until semester then pushing five days a week with online learning to start the second semester uh, we also know that right after winter break we would then send out another canvas of online learning versus five days a week um, right now, the uh, not recommending full remote after break. Uh, this would be monitored again by a classroom, grade level, or billing using our COVID data. If we see staff, when we see staffing is our biggest factor for switching. So it would be asked later in the board meeting um, for the board to consider extending hybrid through the first semester and starting second semester five days a week on site, which was the plan that would have been November 30th with an online option. Looking at the 2021-22 staffing, as uh, Mr. Velas was here talking about the 512 vision, and we also talked about staffing. We know through some early retirements, we'll discuss later, um, but we also know some critical positions that we believe uh, we need to start um, looking for. 
These are positions that we had planned for uh, since we started talking about um, a 912 high school and looking at our numbers that will start in those buildings once they open up at the end, uh, beginning of next year. We're looking at recommending <coughs> beginning with a uh, assistant principal a position to open up for our high school. Uh, that campus 912 will open up next year with 900 students currently. 934 if you look at our current numbers. Uh, we look at expect growth to happen as well. Um, previously that building was at 925 in the past, or 625 in the past and did have a full-time principal as well as assistant principal. Although that full-time principal did do district level work as well, which warranted an assistant principal with 625 students. So the recommendation um, is posting for a assistant principal in December. Um, I can share the full um, hiring plan for that position at the December board meeting, but to post that position uh, to begin the interview process, looking at probably the 1st of January. Um, another position that we know needs to be identified, I mean, just to remind people, uh, the 512 campus, over 900 students, that is uh, Meadows and High School combined, um, are, oh, I can go through the enrollment numbers later too, I see. Uh, another position we believe is, is could warrant early hiring, uh, to help support our nurse and uh, COVID-19 and knowing that we will have that position for next year we'll be hiring of a nurse uh, for the 7-8 building and we will continue with uh, the 900 plus students at the high school we would have a, a nurse as well as a, a nurse associate um, that would continue to support uh, the high school campus So at this point, I'm looking at uh, increase of staffing for next year or would be a beginning of increase of staffing at the 512 Vision. And I know, Mrs. Wilson, you, Director Wilson, you commented on staffing and increasing staff, and this is the beginning of that conversation. Um, the two, first two positions would be assistant principal at the high school. They would have similar um, assistant pay as well as uh, same benefits that our rest of our administrative team has. They would also become part of the cabinet um, as part of our cabinet administrative meetings. That is different than the current positions we have with dean um, or instructional coaches or other um, levels within the buildings. Any questions on those two positions? Will the 5-6 building have a nurse? Uh, the 5-6 building with the numbers um, when you look at the numbers, I think Allison Elementary will sit at about 200, a little over 200, and the 5-6 um, building will be over 500, and it's on the enrollment page that I sh um, can share later. Uh, currently, we have a, um, a nurse over there, I believe. And a nurse associate. And a nurse associate. Okay. So that will work. So every building will have a support for health in it, either a nurse or a nurse associate. Uh, the nurses oversee those two buildings, the nurse associate then supports those buildings as well. And with a 900 plus uh, secondary building, knowing that we will also have um, kind of the athletics for 912, we'll need that support as well. And we'll also have a 78 building with athletics. Um, those do add a different layer for the nursing supports in those buildings as well. So that we're done, identify a full-time nurse for the 70 building. Hey Scott, Ryan, just wanna make sure I understand. So we'll, we'll have a full-time nurse or nurse associate in every building? Correct. Starting next year? We have it currently. Can you share a little bit about what an assistant principal's role looks like and what and what they will be responsible for and how they <coughs> um, share duties with a, the full principal? Um, yeah, we have met um, with high school, um, Mr. Bloom, as well as uh, Mrs. Ben Workham, myself, and just looking at as, as well as the 512 secondary. <coughs> what we do is we identify. Um, 
kind of the roles and responsibilities for those positions. So I've had this conversation for an assistant principal with the high school principals for at least the last seven years to prepare for an assistant principal and what those roles and responsibilities are. Um, typically they'll start, when you hear an assistant principal, you think behavior. That is the traditional assistant principal role. Um, it will be identified to help support the building principal who will focus on instructional leadership. Uh, they will also pick up some um, evaluation responsibilities uh, within that building. They'll support behavior uh, and then they'll support other duties as assigned um, for those buildings. Um, they will add support and oversee for students in that 9-12. We will then still have uh, other supports beyond. So you have high school principal, assistant principal, um, and then you'll have still counseling uh, support within that building as well. Scott, I wanted to follow up on that as well. I, we can't have everything we want all at once. And so I ask this more as a, as a planning question. If um, I want Lori to be able to maintain the same number of guidance counselors that she currently has when she shifts campuses, so now we add three hundred students with the same number of guidance counselors with a mental health emphasis that concerns me. We have a plan in place, but for that plan to work forward, we need to hire some positions first. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it was three years ago or four years ago, I discussed with the board about staffing. Um, there was a time where we felt um, the dean role was supportive for what we needed. And I believe at that point I discussed the option of we need to move um, more towards counseling uh, supports in buildings and that increased some of that counseling in well first off the seven eight or eight nine building if you remember right we needed more supports when we put eighth graders and ninth graders together um, and then we also know we've increased some counseling support at our, our high school as well as maintaining our dean um, as well as our student supports at risk. Very good. Uh, construction updates on the 7 8 building. Um, walk the, well, we've been walking the building more frequently uh, as well as weekly meetings. I uh, was fortunate to walk through the building uh, Friday with uh, Director Carpenter who has some insight on construction. Um, through that, I think the easiest thing to look at is they have a plan to enclose that building in segments. They're working from north to south in the pods, and this is the whole construction project in that direction. Uh, they are looking at enclosing the A, the for, farthest north pod, getting glazing up, if not glazing, enclosing that, putting heat in, uh, for that segment and they've already um, locked it out. They're looking at heating the building or starting heating it August 30th. Uh, that will help them to uh, work through some interior finishes as they move from north. Sorry, Scott, is it August 30th? No, not August 30th. <laughs> I would have preferred August 30th. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, a long, that, cold winter, we have to wait another year. <laughs> November 30th, December. Uh, all the material for the glazing windows is on site. Um, it's, it's just putting up from north to south, segmenting that building off. Um, one of the challenges in that building is the two interior courts, um, the interior classrooms. Uh, for that work to, con to happen with the timing, they need to get in and out and through that as part of the glazing or window process. But uh, they, are working to a completion date of the end of June. Uh, we are holding them to that, um, as well as having weekly communication with percentages of, of completion, um, employees on site, and uh, kind of a timeline to where they're heading. The administrative building update, they have the siding uh, up in the corner. Uh, the logo must have been a little too bulky because it fell off. They'll be repairing that, um, as well as um, they did hire a different company to come in and complete the front shade look. 
uh, so they have someone else coming in to complete that work. Um, other than kind of some of the change work, not change work stuff, but interior, just a bunch of stuff, we're still working through those, but that's the major part for the administration building. Uh, we will be, um, I have contacted the technology, the uh, electronic company, uh, <coughs> providing a quote and price to uh, get this room to be stream capable, as well as um, video production. Five, six middle school edition. Uh, so they, uh, the main part's that pod. They're enclosing that pod right now. They're putting up uh, drywall. Uh, ceiling tiles are going in, lights are going in. They believe they, they will have that pod completed by the end of December. Uh, we could look at a transition earlier than um, spring break for some classrooms that we do need to transfer at spring break. Um, but we're not looking at that because we do not want to disrupt our, our staff at this point. They have enough on their plate and then now think of shifting um, at least winter break into a new pod. Uh, the rest of the stuff in the interior, they're working on the new student services area. Um, that, that we see not really any timing issues within that project. Um, that's an update on construction projects. Enrollment update. I'm sure this was a different look because this was the uh, first time that we broke the buildings out now with. Uh, I know it sounds like four elementaries, but technically we'll probably have five elementaries when we report to the state. Uh, the five six building will be identified as an elementary from the state level, although we are looking at how to connect that with five twelve vision. And this is our last communicated to you. Uh, looking at those numbers, uh, we do see uh, enrollment growth. We have not seen as much growth as we projected a year ago. Um, and it starts to look at the class sizes for... Did I miss some pages? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not the, we don't have the individual. I see that. So let me go, I will send those numbers out to you, but let me just break it down by building because I think that's what people, um, with a shift of staff for fifth and sixth grade, and I will be looking at 11 sections of fifth grade next year. We currently have 12. Uh, next year we'll have um, 11 sections of sixth grade, and we currently have 10. Um, no, we might have 11. Well, anyway. Uh, we have a resignation tonight, which is fifth grade, but um, it should even out with those. I also have the projected um, increases that we would need for next year in our elementary uh, on that page as well. And those numbers, sorry, I didn't get those into the packet. It was nice of you all to provide me grace and not email me and tell me. <laughs> They were not in there. Looking at those numbers um, by building, we're looking at our, fills, our facilities. I'm just going to go from this year to last year, this year to next year. Uh, South Prairie, we have 22 um, in the building, 22 sections. Next year, we'll have 18 when fifth grade goes out. This year, we currently have 488 students totally, total in South Prairie. Next year, we'll have 404. Uh, Heritage currently has 22.5 sections in it. Next year will be 20 point, uh, 20 and a half, so we have uh, pre-K in there as well, if you're wondering how that section works. We currently have 419 students in Heritage. Next year we'll open 360. Um, that is down, so South Prairie is down 84 students in the building. Heritage will be down projected 59 students. Northridge this uh, year has four. 188 with 22 sections. If you remember right, that's been yellow for a number of years because we've been at capacity. So I've been able to take the yellow mark off. Uh, next year we'll have 19 sections in the building. That'll be down three sections, three classrooms, and we'll be down 84 students in Northridge Elementary. Dallas Center Elementary currently has 249 students in it at 12 sections. Next year will be 209 students at 10 sections. That'll be down 40 students. 
All the students added over will move to our fifth grade, which will be moving to the new building, and that will open up to 265 students currently. Uh, that's at four, 24 um, students per class with 11 sections. That is a decrease from 12 sections. And then sixth grade is 283 next year projected. That's a ranging between 25 and 25 to 26 per class. Uh, and that's looking at an increase of classroom teacher to 11 sections. Um, looking at our 7-8 building, this year we have our 8-9 building currently, but uh, that is 494. Our 7-8 building will open up to 522. That's an increase of 28, at least for that administrative, um, for that administration and counseling team. The high school this year has 669 currently in it. Um, and next year they will have 934 currently. That's an increase of 265 students in that building. It's not an increase of the building, it's the same building, but a 912 campus. I will share those out, but the new projection will be broke down um, now by their buildings for next year and going forward. Looking at increases for elementary right now, South Prairie would be up a section in one grade and down a section in one grade, so that's an even enrollment right now. Heritage would actually be up a section, so that would be an increase of one elementary teacher at this point. Northridge would be down a section in one grade and up a section in another grade, so that would be an even, so there'd be no increase in staff for Northridge. And Dallas Center right now would not need an increase in staff. So currently our projected increase for staffing for elementary next year is one classroom teacher. Understand that we've been preparing for this transition and some of those classes were either small or large, um, but right now that's currently with our current numbers um, going forward, that's an increase of one classroom teacher. That's the numbers. Projected wise, we were down percentage, but we're about 98% accurate on our prediction, our projected numbers between last year and this year. Our enrollment guy, who we hire, RSP, um, will be coming in November, so he's going to actually give us updated numbers from last year, this year. Um, so, what month, November? <laughs> January. January. He'll be coming in January. This is what happens when you go past nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, any questions on the enrollment? I just have one question, and it really is probably uh, for a future, but at what point will we kind of have an idea what a 912 campus means again with two buildings? Because last time we were at a 912 campus, we had one building. And, and just kind of, kind of, maybe it's just keeping it on the agenda, of course, at some point in the future to have that conversation about what that 912 vision looks like with two buildings connected by a big long hall. Correct. And so we will be looking at um, the next phase of that facilities. And we know that we will not be able to have changes to that campus for next year because we were waiting until all these other projects got done. We'll be starting meeting with architects in January, February, to begin that conversation of how does that facility look and what are the needs we need um, in there when we do have two of everything and uh, kind of that design aspect of it of how do we use our current space and then the other piece of that with our 512 vision is talking about the staffing and you know, location, I think automatically people think ninth grade is like one whole building and then 1012 is the rest of the building and that's not how that's going to be able to mathematically work out around the campus. Uh, but we will need to identify, um, at least for next year in the current building, you know, where people are located, offices and then classroom space. We also know that there's some space that may not be utilized next year um, it'll just be in a design phase with FRK and a small a, a committee uh, to kind of discuss of what's the next changes we can do to this building and with what dollars do we have left through all of our other projects. Any 
Next on the agenda. Future meeting presentations. Future meeting presentations. We did switch Mr. Halas in today. Um, it would have been Northridge so that he could uh, timely talk about the five, six. Uh, but the future meeting presentations um, are located for you. Next month will be uh, Mr. Bloom at the high school. Michelle? If I could direct you to your public or to your monthly revenue and expenditure comparison, you'll see that we are 28 point. Can you turn your mic on, please? You can see that we are 28.25 percent of expenditures, which is right in line with three in the last four years. It's where we expect it to be. <coughs> um, an important thing to note as far as revenue is we are finally above 50 percent of the year for property tax collection so that is a relief that um, we did get the first half collected entirely moving on to the next report the public budget comparison i want to correct a number that is in that and support services the percentage for this month should be 51.79 percent um, the total of all of the support staff services added in as a subtotal. So please correct your copy to 51.79 at 41.67% of the year. As we look at what you published in the newspaper last year in March versus what has actually happened, we have had additional spending in the support services area. And we will likely need to amend that piece of the budget. I encourage you to remember that uh, as we amend that budget, it is just a new publishing. It does not affect property taxes or state aid or any of those collections. It's just uh, a copy that gets printed in the newspaper for amendment. Moving forward, um, I direct you to the application for increasing enrollment, open enrollment out, and LEP instruction beyond five years. Um, we have an increase in students uh, from the count this year of 96.6 .6 students. When you multiply that times the district cost per pupil of $7,048, you come up with $680,836.80. And that will be the request that I ask for you to approve tonight in new business to take to the school budget review committee. This gives you authority. It does not come with funding. It is just the authority to spend for those additional students that you are having to educate at this time. Uh, we have none in open enrollment out that were not on the fall count in 2019. And uh, that part of that is for a decline in that area. So we won't request anything in that area. Finally, in English language learners beyond five years, there are nine additional students that, or nine students that had additional learning beyond the fifth year, which is the amount allowed in ELL. Uh, the weighting for those students is 0.22, so that comes to a total of 1.98 students to be considered at the district cost per pupil of $7,048, or a total of $13,955 that we will request from the School Budget Review Committee and authority. So um, those are due to the School Budget Review Committee on December 2nd. And after your action tonight in new business, I will put your application forward to that committee. Do you have specific questions about that approval or any of the other information I presented tonight? Thank you. Mark, was there anything you wanted to say about that IASB convention? Uh, most of it's already in the report. I, I would say encourage if and when you get a chance to be part of the delegate assembly. It's insightful. It was uh, probably as valuable as anything I've done as, as a school board member, learning what goes into the process and, and, and the thinking that goes into to, um, so much of the work that they put out there. The priorities um, are, are spelled out for this next year of mental health, SSA, school funding, and preschool and COVID remediation. Money's at the center of just about every topic. Um, and in the spirit of that, there was also a 1% increase in dues for the next year. I'm sorry, Michelle. <laughs> um, but um, there's, there's great concern from a budget lens, but um, insightful stuff. It was really good. Um, 
the report pretty much covers the rest of it. If you want to have a side conversation, we certainly can. But um, if you get a chance next year, you should definitely jump in. No, one observation I would make, and it was, I know a number of you got to attend the conference as well, but um, if you didn't, the my big takeaway is we certainly are not alone in anything that we've experienced at all. So as I listened to, I went to like a couple of different conversations. I attended some of the president conversations and the, the lunch working session, and they're experiencing everything that we're experiencing, um, which is not unique. Old business. Um, first item on old business is the second reading of the board policies related to student health, the 507 section. Um, is there any conversation on it? If not, is there a motion? Move to approve the journal. Second, Wills. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Under new business, um, we have the, a couple of the organizational topics coming up. The first one being the set the monthly meetings, days, times, and location. Is there anything you wanted to say about that, Michelle? Or yeah, what we would like to do is increase um, um, at least three work sessions next year. Uh, we find them to be the timely time that we probably have some longer board meetings or need to have more communication to start with. Uh, we eventually uh, can see this increasing uh, the following year. Um, some board work sessions we'd be looking at, uh, one in June, a year in the end wrap up as well as discussion of goals for next year. We believe September uh, with the beginning of the school year um, and then review of the goals set uh, for the year. And then in March, I know we have our um, budget planning that usually is attached to a board meeting. We remove that from that board meeting and that would become a separate session just talking about budget planning, staffing, um, overall uh, the budget for the following year. Tonight, we just need to establish what the regular sessions are, correct? Yes. And so I think what um, what's been laid out previously is it, is it the either the first or fourth week of the month works the best um, in order to approve a number of things coming out of the business office. We've traditionally done the fourth week of the month, and then you can see what the adjustments would be in order to make that work to avoid some of the holidays. I guess I'd be looking for a motion to approve. Um, our current practice with those um, adjustments for the holidays. I would move to approve the bills. Second. Ronnie. Weedman. Second for Ronnie. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Um, next up is the approval of the learning model um, for number for November 30th to continue the AB hybrid um, and to push back the return to five days to the second semester and continue to monitor our rates and determine when if we need to move to remote online learning by classroom building or district. Any last conversation? If not, is there a motion? Second. Second, Will. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Uh, approval of the proposed science course and pathway uh, that Joe walked us through. Move to approve. Hickok. Second. Adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. And the first reading of the board policy 505 related to graduation requirements. Move to approve, Wilson. Second, adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. And then the approval of the SBRC application for increased enrollment in 2021. 
That's what uh, Michelle just stepped us through a few minutes ago. Move to approve. Wells. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes. It's unanimous. And then the, um, SR, the SBRC application for the ELL will be on five years. Move to approve the document. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Um, okay, so then this is the second topic related to uh, the organizational meeting. This is setting up the uh, board committees. Um, and that's tab O. And I guess maybe a, an easy question to ask might be, is anybody looking for a change? Or are the, or do you have questions about the committees too? I guess it would just be a general place to start. If there are no questions, is anybody looking to swap something out or has an interest in something that they're not participating in? Otherwise, we can leave it as is. All right. Is there a motion to um, approve the committees that we used the way we had them laid out last year? I'll move to leave as is, Carpenter. Second, Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Brings us to the uh, approval of the following certified staff for early resignation and retirement incentive under board policy 405. Is there anything you want to say about that? Um, this is the beginning of the resignation or the early retirements. Um, that individuals taking under the board policy. I believe there will be more um, for those to come in. Um, there's a lot of years of experience uh, through, the student, or through the staff that are currently here. Um, when you looked at the Zoom for information provided out, uh, there's a number of more that I may consider taking uh, a retirement incentive. Uh, currently, we have Candace Berkeley, Tim Lauk, Jean Peters, Jana Payton, Jill Pickell, and Angie Reed. A lot of years of service, and we will acknowledge each one of them as we accept their resignations. This is a little bit like the who's who of DCG, like a, a, the first step. Uh, and yes, huge congrats to them, but also, wow, what a change that's going to be for our district. Is there an initial motion? Move to approve Hickok. Second, Pedro. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes, it's unanimous. So we'll consider the resignation of Candace Berkeley at the close of the 2021 school year and approve her application for early retirement under board policy code 405. And we'd like to express our gratitude for Candace's 25 years of service to the school district teachers and students of Dallas Underground Schools. Is there a motion? Move to approve the journal. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Consider the resignation of uh, Tim Lauk at the close of 2021 school year and express gratitude for Tim's 21 years of service to the school district teachers and students of Dallas Underground Schools. Is there a motion? Move to accept. Wills? Second. Second. Carpenter. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Consider the resignation of uh, Jean Peters at the close of the 2021 school year and express gratitude for her 21 years of service to the school district, teachers, and students of Dallas and the Drag Schools. Is there a motion? Move to accept. Carpenter. Second, Pajaro. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. Consider the resignation of Janet Payton at the close of the 2021 
school year and express gratitude for Jana's 21 years of service to the school district, teachers, and students of Dallas Underground School. Is there a motion? Move to approve the meeting. Second, adjourn. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion passes. It's unanimous. Consider the, res the resignation of Jill Patel at the close of the 2021 school year and express gratitude for Jill's 30 years of service to the school district, teachers and students of Dallas Underground Schools. Is there a motion? Move to approve the journal. Second, rules. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Oops. Anyone opposed? Motion passes. It's unanimous. And lastly, I think, consider the resignation of Angie Reed at the end of the 2021 school year. Express gratitude for Angie's 30 years of service as well to the school district, teachers, and students of Dallas Underground Schools. Is there a motion? Yeah, we should accept Wilson. Second, Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Next up is the uh, to deny open enrollment out application for MO and DO due to the application being filed late with no good cause. Is there a motion? Move to move to deny. Second, pick up. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. The motion passes. It's unanimous. Approve the termination of DCG employee TH based on administrative recommendation. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Financial statements. Is there a motion? Move to approve. <coughs> second. Adjourn. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Board commendations. Move to approve the journal. Second, Wills. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion passes. It's unanimous. Uh, written and oral communication. So the next regular board meeting will be Monday, December 21st. Um, that's a move from the typical fourth Monday of the month. Anything else under communication? If not, is there a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Adjourn. Second, Wilson. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. It's unanimous.